Hello, my name is Nathan Kuntz. I'm the CEO of a company called Rendered AI. And today, I want to talk to you about next generation tools for synthetic data and AI training. Um, just really briefly about uh, Rendered AI, we provide a, a platform as a service for synthetic data generation. And while I'm going to touch on that, a lot of the conversation I'd like to have today is about how we can actually use synthetic data as part of a robust engineering process uh, to produce data sets that are effective at, at getting to good AI performance. Um, my hope is that at the end of this, at a minimum, you know what I mean when I say a platform uh, for synthetic data. So we're going to start with a little bit of the, the what and why of synthetic data, uh, why it's become important. It's, it's, a, it's an increasingly important topic in the world of AI ML. Um, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time going through a very reductive introduction to what simulation workflows uh, look like, uh, then talk about how synthetic data is different than pure simulations, uh, go into what that implies in terms of the architecture required to effectively generate synthetic data, how those needs can be addressed with a platform approach, then I'll spend a little bit of time on a case study, uh, some examples about how that actually works in practice. We'll get into a demo and show you what it looks like in the real world. All right, but let's start with, with the problem. Um, there's a pretty significant problem across a huge portion of the artificial intelligence industry that basically amounts to a lack of data. Um, now, the reason that data is so central is because, as I often like to say, artificial intelligence is really just software written in data. <laughs> written in data instead of some other programming language. We rely on the data to really drive the fundamentals of performance for the algorithms that we create. And what that means is that in a modern context, when a lot of the AI models themselves, when a lot of the architectures have been developed and are, have become more or less standard, all the work now is in collecting the right data uh, to train those models and to be effective. Uh, and so, uh, a data scientist, uh, and this is just a number from The Economist, may spend as much as 80% of their time uh, just collecting, cleaning, uh, and refining data sets. Uh, and it's 80% of their time. They would spend more time on it if they could, because that's where all the performance comes from. But there's just other things they have to do as well. And still, they don't have enough data, uh, particularly when it comes to things like edge cases, and when we start to introduce bias because we don't understand or can't control what's in our data sets. So let's break that down a little bit. What are the reasons that people have trouble with data? Uh, one of the maybe most obvious ones is that it's really important that we be able to understand events and objects that are rare. Imagine an overturned truck in a freeway. It's really important for a car to be able to understand what that is, and yet you don't see very many of them. Uh, the same thing comes up in satellite imagery, where there are objects that are really important to identify that you might only ever see once or twice, or only see once or twice in a particular context. Um, and so with very, few, uh, with very few examples, it's very hard to build or impossible to build uh, training models on those. And even when there is data available, when it's rare, when, you, when you're talking about needing to build models on rare data, uh, it can really expand the amount of data that, that needs to be collected. So if something shows up only 1% of the time, you end up needing to collect 100 times more data. And that becomes a huge uh, cost in terms of acquisition of data and annotation of that data. So the second reason that people uh, really struggle with data sets is annotations. And I touched on that briefly with, with the rare object event. But annotations, when we're talking about, hey, pictures that we take with our camera, our uh, cell phone camera, and I want to identify a chair or a person, seem fairly straightforward. But even that actually can be uh, uh, quite expensive and difficult to get consistency around. When we move outside of those uh, types of domains and we start to operate in industrial domains or other uh, more sophisticated environments, the sensors are really no longer even possible for humans to often interpret. So as we start to look at radar imagery, if we look at infrared imagery, x-ray imagery, those are all uh, circumstances where a person can't necessarily look at those images and even determine what's in them. Uh, so annotation moves from expensive and difficult to impossible. 
Uh, the third reason that we see a real limitation in data, and this is gonna see kind of obvious after I say it, but it's something that gets missed in the industry a lot, is that some of the most important sensors that we need to design algorithms for don't exist yet. <laughs> They're the systems that come next. We have this incredible problem in artificial intelligence where we rely on sensors that were designed largely for a different purpose. And as we start to try to build towards a future where automated detection is a central piece of building next generation systems, we by definition lack the data sets necessary to build those models and test their efficacy. And what that leads to is a broken engineering process where we can't even really begin to determine what should be in those, those sensors in the first place. Um, and then finally, uh, many of the data sets that we do have, even if none of the other problems are playing a role, are restricted in some way. They may be, uh, they may, there may be security concerns, uh, there may be uh, uh, p uh, personal information in those data sets, and so even though the data exists, we can't use it. Oh, unfortunately, they fixed the slide yesterday, but it didn't get fixed. All right. But let's, let's talk through uh, what this looks like in practice if we're, if we're starting to uh, build an algorithm. The implication of all of that difficulty with collecting data is that we end up with static data sets. Um, in large part, we think about data in the, AMI, excuse me, in the AI ML world as an asset that we're going to use. And what that leads is to this linear engineering flow where we use a data set that we happen to have been able to collect, usually at great expense and time. We move it through a model training process. Maybe we can change some hyperparameters and, and adjust a few things along the way. And then basically we get to a result that we either accept or reject. In any other field of engineering, this would be crazy, right? This would be like, let's build a bridge. And then once we've built a bridge, we're gonna just like run some cars over it. And if the bridge falls into the river, <laughs> That was a bad bridge, we won't use it. But if it doesn't fall into the river, ship it. <laughs> that, is not, that is not how modern tools should be engineered, and yet that is what we rely on. A lot of artificial intelligence really relies on basically doing that without the ability to either test for edge cases and defects or fix them if you find them. Okay, so that brings us to why we care about synthetic data. So synthetic data is simulated and engineered data where we, instead of relying on the real world data with all the problems that we highlighted earlier, start to build our own data sets. And we actually create uh, in software small worlds that we are able to simulate interacting with different sensor types. Uh, you know, a simple example is a video game. Uh, as you're walking around on the street and in a video game, that is essentially a simulation of visual light in that video game, but we can do essentially the same things across a wide variety of other sensor modalities. And if we start to engineer that and use those as data sets in an AI workflow, that's what we call synthetic data. That is such an important problem to solve that at this point Gartner is saying that in the next three years, 60% of the data we use in AI is going to be synthetic, and by the end of the decade, nearly 100%. And the reason is just all the things we said before. You can't get there from here with real data, and so we need to find new tools. And when we start to do that, it does more than just uh, give us access to a different static data set. It actually completely revamps what the engineering workflows look like. And instead of relying on this linear approach where we build or we have a data set, we build an algorithm and sort of accept or reject it, we can now continue to iterate and make the data a part of the engineering solution. All right, so if I've, if I've done my job, then in the first 10 minutes of this presentation, you've come to understand the importance of synthetic data and why we care so much about being able to use it effectively. So let's get into a little bit about how. The first thing you might think is, hey, if I have a simulator, if I can just simulate things really effectively, then I'm gonna get high quality data, right? I mean, I just include all the different effects I simulate them, I end up with a data set, and that's gonna give me a good AI model. Uh, and it turns out, this doesn't work, really, ever. Because it's a little bit like saying, hey, if I have a good camera, I'll have a good movie. Like, well, a good camera is important, but 
It's not the same thing as getting to a good movie. You're missing everything else about the creative process. And what you end up doing is having kind of very reductive outcomes. All right, so what does a real synthetic data workflow look like? Well, we've got to, uh, we've got to bring in assets. So we've got uh, 3D models and, and worlds that we need to build up. We need to create diversity in that. So things not just, don't just seem to be placed in, in different areas, but all the varieties that we might see in the world uh, really need to be included. We do need a good simulator. That's an important step. Usually we're talking about large amounts of compute required because these are high fidelity simulations. So we need to take all of those assets and uh, simulation code, deploy it in a way that these, uh, these images can be generated and then brought back, collected, and annotated. That whole system needs to be taskable by the engineers who are actually doing the work. Uh, and so to make this efficient, they need to have some way to say, hey, I want this in my data set. And then once they have it, they often need to be able to get rid of various defects or adjust what's called the domain of the synthetic data generated. And then, of course, establish quality, or at least question the quality of the data that's been generated before piping it into an AI model. And so I want to dive into uh, each of these areas and spend a little bit of time talking about, you know, what is involved, uh, what is involved here. And so let's start with asset acquisition. So when we're building up uh, these environments, almost always there's, a, there's an assumed kind of 3D world that we're going to build. And that can have uh, relatively low poly assets or very, very high fidelity assets, depending on the needs. Uh, sometimes those assets will have different materials. So if I'm looking at them in optical space, I really only care about how light interactions with them. But if, for instance, I need to care about radar returns, I need to understand those materials differently. Um, the people who bring these assets in, work with simulations, and define how the world is going to be built, we call synthetic data engineers, a really exciting uh, new field of engineering that's really start to be built up. Um, and the first thing that you need to know about synthetic data engineers is they are not data scientists. <laughs> and this is something that is missing in a lot of the discussion around synthetic data, where a synthetic data engineer really has a domain of expertise um, around how they're going to bring in those models, how they understand simulations, uh, but the data scientists uh, need to be the ones that are using the data and they have a very different workflow. Uh, so a data scientist needs to be able to task data set generation, um, adjust those data sets, make that uh, uh, additional uh, controls become very important, and then ultimately assess which of those generated data sets are gonna be used uh, in, in, their, uh, in their workflow. And then importantly, they need to be able to iterate on that. So they need to be able to come back to the well and create more. Uh, and then finally, well here, let's do this. Neither data scientists uh, nor synthetic data engineers are typically uh, cloud computing full stack engineers. And so this other piece where you wanna take both of those capabilities and now deploy them to the cloud requires a third set of skills. So anything that, uh, that is gonna be effective in actually engineering and going through this engineering workflow of effective synthetic data generation is gonna require those capabilities as well. All right, well, I promised that I would uh, explain what a platform for synthetic data engineering is. And uh, basically, that's a platform that solves all of those major workflow elements. So not just generating data sets, but the whole uh, building the applications, integrating the content, content management systems, um, managing the compute uh, uh, to actually produce those simulations, a tasking infrastructure, uh, and then finally the ability to uh, assess the quality of the synthetic data, adapt uh, domains and other things. And that's what, that's what we do at Rendered AI. We have built out a framework uh, to actually address all of these uh, major issues along the way and we have a stack of tools that goes through each one. So I don't wanna read this whole slide to you, but uh, when you go to build a synthetic data application, it is helpful to have a set of developer tools. Um, and so we have those open source, they're available on our website, www.renderedai, it'll point you 
uh, uh, to the GitHub, uh, excuse me, to our GitHub repository for that. We provide a content management system. When you start to actually get into the world of synthetic data, it is not uncommon to have hundreds of gigabytes or even a terabyte of content associated with particular simulations. Uh, you don't want that to reside on your Docker container uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, we have a lot of different code examples, and I'm going to go through a few of uh, the types of things that we've done. Um, we do bundle in uh, GPU access, and uh, we do that in, in, a, in an unlimited way, in the same way that your cell phone plan is unlimited. We don't cap the number of images people generate or cap the number of hours that they use. Uh, we just cap the max number of instances that are available at a time. Um, and anyway, we take all of these tools and we also wrap them in both a web access, which I'll be able to demo here in a few minutes, and a Python SDK, uh, which allows us to interact with the entire system from a native Jupyter uh, notebook experience. Um, we've been building uh, a lot of content onto our platform over the last couple of years. Uh, so that includes uh, open source tools like Blender, uh, but also partners like uh, Jane's. Uh, we've partnered with NVIDIA Omniverse. Uh, uh, Deersig, which uh, is a relatively small organization but does some of the best hyperspectral simulations in the world. Uh, Quadradox, similarly, small organization but does some of the best X-ray simulations in the world. And Esri, uh, one of the largest uh, geospatial uh, information systems providers. And so what we end up with by bringing all of these tools together is just a wide variety of, of different capabilities that can all be deployed using the same underlying infrastructure. So by handling that infrastructure separately from the applications and then deploying applications on top of it, uh, we can get all those tools that I just highlighted and then use them across really a very wide variety of different applications, which can extend from overhead imagery and uh, its varieties uh, to x-ray to medical applications. And there's a few of those that I want to spend a little bit of time walking through to give you a flavor of real-world applications that are incredibly important uh, where synthetic data is crucial and physics-based uh, synthetic data can be uh, really well used. So the first is, is what's called synthetic aperture radar. So uh, in synthetic aperture radar, we are using either a plane or, um, or a satellite passing it over a scene uh, and, and measuring radar returns as we move across that scene. We then collect all of those radar returns, apply a bunch of fancy math, and basically get back to images that look like the ones that you're seeing here. Uh, the ones that you're seeing here are actually simulated images, uh, and they look uh, just about exactly <laughs> as you would see them in the real world, in this case of a tanker ship. Uh, the reason that we care about this kind of imaging is that at any given time, um, about 70% of the Earth is covered in clouds, and 50% of it is covered in darkness. So if you want to be able to see things, uh, cameras that are passive imagers don't always work. And so it's really important to have alternatives. But here's the thing. If you start using synthetic aperture radar, things look very different depending on how you take the image. In fact, the three images here are all of the exact same ship in the exact same position. <laughs> the only thing that's changed is where the satellite is as it passes over the scene. Well, if you think about trying to train an AI model for that, I can't just say this is what the ship looks like anymore. <laughs> I have to explain or provide data sets about all of the different ways, not only that the object could be positioned, but that the data could be collected as well, because that becomes a really important parameter and really controls a lot of what we see. Um, the benefit of doing that is now I can see through clouds and now I can see at night. And increasingly, synthetic aperture radar looks like it'll become um, maybe even a dominant uh, player in, in, in terms of our understanding of the world and how it's growing via uh, uh, things like drone and satellite imagery. Okay, but let's, let's go back a little bit to satellite imagery. So just to be clear, and I know this is a fairly broad audience here, um, satellite images often are exactly what you think they would be. Basically, you put a camera on a satellite, snap some photos, just like your, just like your phone would. But whereas your phone has three color channels, so red, green, and blue, uh, so RGB imagery, 
the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, could have as many different channels as you want, and often those have really important information in them. So if you start to look at, hey, I want to see, you know, this part of the spectrum might be a, a good indication of, of a methane leak. Maybe we can really start to see methane plumes by, by looking at that, what's called a band or, or a particular color. Um, others might be a great indication of whether or not a forest is healthy. Uh, yet others might help you understand uh, whether or not crops need to be watered or have diseases in certain areas. Uh, others uh, still might be associated with different minerals that need to be mined. So this exploration of the electromagnetic spectrum and using novel sensors is called hyperspectral imagery. Now, remember when I said that human beings can't label all this data? <laughs> well, this is a good example of that. <laughs> it's really hard to tell what you're looking at. Often these are relatively low resolution spatially, um, but very, very high resolution spectrally. And so in order to train systems to use that data, we really do need to rely on simulated data sets. Um, and, and shown here is just one example of the way in which roads can show up in infrared imagery, uh, whereas they would otherwise be, be very, uh, pretty heavily obfuscated. And then finally, uh, I wanted to mention X-ray imagery, uh, th and these were done in partnership with a company that we work with called Quadradox. Um, so this is a security application that I'm showing here, uh, where we're actually looking at baggage scans. This is crucial, right? We all travel. Uh, if you know, I'm at a conference right now, just about everybody here flew to get here and had to put their bag through, uh, uh, through a security scanner. Well, there's AI in those security scanners that is determining whether or not there are th threats present that work alongside the humans there. And if you think about what is necessary to actually train that AI, they literally have to put different objects into bags, pass it through security scanners, knowing what's in there, in order to generate data sets, because otherwise there just aren't enough examples of the things of the threats that they need to find. Um, it's incredibly expensive, it's very time consuming, and really limited in terms of the number of objects and types of varieties they can create. And so uh, synthetic data is a great way to get around that and start to generate imagery where we know what's in the bag and we can get to very, very high fidelity simulations of how that will look when imaged, and all the images here are in fact uh, synthetic simulated images. Well, that's in baggage scanning. As you can imagine, we have the same problem when it comes to medical diagnosis. Uh, excuse me, medical diagnosis. Um, people show up in all shapes and sizes. If we want to avoid things like bias in those data sets, synthetic data can be incredibly powerful. All right. I uh, just wanted to share one example, uh, in this case, of some work that we did with a company called Orbital Insight. Uh, where we used not just a synthetic data set, but we actually empowered their team to create synthetic data sets on the fly. Um, and they started to look for a number of different objects which were relatively rare, although not extremely rare, uh, but very difficult to recognize in satellite imagery. And so those were uh, crane trucks. Um, so if crane truck is, you can imagine, sort of like a fire truck with a crane on the back of it tower cranes, and mobile cranes. Uh, interestingly, the first thing we found when we dove into this data set was that a bunch of it was mislabeled. <laughs> and so before we even got started on this project, we looked at the synthetic data images to make sure that they had in fact labeled the real world images correctly. <laughs> and we fixed all the labels uh, by, because we could understand what those objects really would look like. Once we fixed those, we still had very low performance uh, when training only on real data. And by introducing uh, synthetic data alongside that, we didn't see you know, a two to three point bump in AP score. We saw a two to three X increase in performance uh, because suddenly we could actually control the data set. Uh, we got to, to much, much higher performance than otherwise would have been possible. Uh, this work continues and we've been seeing really tremendous performance, not only with uh, low data set examples, but even in, in what's called so-called uh, no-shot circumstances where we, where we don't have any real data at all, uh, where uh, in order to even run the tests, what we take the small amount of real data that we have, we use only to test, uh, and, and we rely on training on synthetic data alone. Okay, 
So, so I hope that you've gotten a sense of why we care about synthetic data, what the synthetic data engineering process looks like, the tools that we can use to make that part of a, a real engineering workflow, and then a few examples of, of real world things where synthetic data is starting to have an impact. So what I wanna do now is, is shift gears a little bit and do a demonstration with you where you can see uh, how this can be integrated, like what the actual experience of a data scientist uh, looks like. All right, would you mind bringing up the demo? Thank you very much. All right, so uh, this is our platform, just to be clear, and I'm not gonna I'm, I'm going to try not to give you too much of a commercial, but just walk you through some of the elements here. Uh, one of the things that is crucial is that we, we do do everything in a collaborative environment. I think like any form of engineering, this is not something a person does, but it's things people do together. Um, and so I want to show you a couple examples of, of how this can be done. And you can tell this is being recorded live because I can't find my mouse. There we go. All right. So I'm gonna start by actually walking you through some content that literally yesterday uh, we, were, we were doing a demo of at CVPR and a tutorial with uh, about 50 different engineers. One of the questions that we, that we run into with synthetic data is you start to wanna control what's in the data set is, well, how in the world are you gonna simulate the entire world? Like how, do you how do you actually control that in a way that's meaningful, right? That's a lot of knobs. <laughs> so of course we don't. What we do is we have applications that somehow narrow that context, that define sort of the, the sensor usually, the environment, and the types of objects that we're trying to model. Um, and then that gets deployed as what we call a channel. And a channel for us is, is an application on our platform. You're, you're probably familiar with Alexa. On Alexa, there are skills. This is rendered AI. We have channels. It's just the name we picked. And what we do in the channel is we actually use this node and edge-based uh, infrastructure to define what's gonna show up. So in this case, this is a very simple example of toys and boxes. But actually, uh, uh, while the specific content of toys is not relevant, this general application of we wanna put things in boxes and then be able to detect them comes up all the time <laughs> in, in industrial applications. And this is based, uh, we built this in partnership with NVIDIA where we really wanted to understand how the performance of, of detection algorithms would change as we changed what was in the boxes and then also increased the volume of things in them. So here we can drop different objects into the box. You can see uh, yo-yos and skateboards and those, if we wanted to add more, we would just come over here to objects and, uh, and drag them in. Those get linked up into um, something that is varying their color in this case. This is a general example of what we call a modifier, a really crucial concept in synthetic data where we wanna be able to stack on uh, different types of varieties. And so changing color is a very simple example, uh, but oftentimes in a synthetic data set, we'll have all sorts of different ways in which we take in a simple object and then start to create varieties in a procedural way on top of that. Uh, we can control the likelihood that things will show up with their weight. Um, and control the statistical distribution, for instance, of things like the number of objects. Um, this, by the way, just to be clear, doesn't define an image. This defines an entire assortment of images. So we're gonna randomly, in this case, generate containers, um, and then right at the end, we're gonna add in some bubbles. So what we would do on the system is, uh, we can take a look at this and then, and then stage it and put it onto the back end. So now, now that we've defined what we want out of a particular data set, we can actually uh, deploy it. And all we have to do now to actually create data is come in here and choose how many images we want. Oops. And press go. Uh, if that was 10 images. Uh, if we wanted 10,000 or 100,000, it's just a few more zeros. Very, very simple. And now getting back to some of that cloud infrastructure, uh, not only do you get the data that you need, but you can see it as it's being generated. You can control things like the priority level. Once that data has been completed, it is deposited back here as a data set. Uh, it'll take a while for that particular one to finish. Uh, but we can view these data sets. We 
can do things like add annotations to them. So there are different mapping files depending on how you want to actually, uh, maybe you want to identify Rubik's cubes as opposed to something else uh, on day on today and you want to do that with Cocoa annotations because of the model that you're using, great. We can create annotations to do that. Uh, tomorrow, maybe you want to come in and, and separate out bubbles, uh, great. You know, in the case of in the case of a lot of these data sets, you don't always start with all the annotations you want. So we have deep metadata about all the images, and then we can create these in post-processing. And then finally, we talked about domain adaptation. So we have a variety of different ways that we can uh, do this. Uh, built into the tool are some GAN-based methods for changing that domain. And uh, that'll run as a microservice right here, native in to this environment. So this is toys and boxes, um, but we could easily come back and look at, for instance, overhead imagery. Excuse me, uh, go here. Now in this case, and I, I just want to show you how different it is. So now we're going to be looking at satellite imagery. There are no longer toys sitting in the graph, but instead we have objects like tower cranes, aircraft, Etc. things that you might want to find from space. But the same basic process works, and I guess what I want to emphasize here is that this general workflow is actually quite generic. So we still have objects that get drawn in, we have ways of placing them, uh, we have modifiers that we create in order to generate diversity on those, uh, and then ultimately we define our sensor and render the scene. Um, same idea, we can create jobs and then uh, use those to generate data sets. And now we get um, a variety of, of different types of data. So now we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at these. So instead of, uh, instead of toys and boxes, now we're looking at uh, overhead imagery of suburban areas with, uh, with cranes in them, all simulated here, just to be clear. Uh, urban environment, same thing, again, all simulated. Again, we can change annotations and GANs. Um, we're going to run out of time here, and I don't have time to bring up all of our comparison tools and the rest of some of our engineering framework, but I'll just say uh, what I've demonstrated is just a fraction of, of the tools that are available, and I hope gives you some flavor for how data sets can be created and then adjusted so you don't just do this once, but then can iterate and generate new data sets very quickly. All right, we should just move on to the thank you slide. Well, I certainly appreciate you uh, staying with me throughout this whole presentation. Um, if uh, you're interested in synthetic data, uh, please reach out. My email address is, uh, can we just, ah, excuse me. My email address is right here, Nathan at Rendered AI. Uh, feel free to reach out to, to me directly, but you can also go to our website, uh, www.renderedai, and uh, we have a trial uh, capability on our platform if you want to use any of the tools that I just showed you. Um, Anyway, thank you very much and a uh, pleasure talking with you.